Hey, testing, 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 testing. <laughs> Down was next, and up was back, wasn't it? It's the most counterintuitive clicker I've ever come across. Okay, right, I think we should get this started. How's the live stream? Are we online? Mum and Dad, tuning in? Cool, 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 cool. Wow, it's a really, really good turnout. Um, whenever it's the first event, you never really know exactly how it's going to go. Even though we had a fantastic number of sign-ups, sometimes the amount of sign-ups you get versus the people that turn up can be a bit different. So, um, so thank you ever so much for coming. So um, I just wanted to, you know, welcome you all. My, uh, I guess my role this evening is just kind of give you a bit of an intro into Digital Taunton as uh, a, an initiative uh, of which D DT Tech falls within that. And, um, and then I'll be passing you over to the main hosts of this evening, which will be uh, Sharon and Dan. So, just wanted to, cool, this is loud. Ooh, should I just put it like up like this? Um, so first of all, I just wanted to just get an understanding of, maybe hands up if you've been to a Digital Taunton event before. Okay, and just hands up if this is the first time anything Digital Taunton related. Oh, that's fantastic. This is kind of what I was hoping for. Um, wanted to get all the nerds out of their house, right? And this was, this was how we were going to do it, because you obviously weren't interested in turning up to the main event, or the other event, I keep saying main event, <laughs> sorry, this is the main event. So we have our, our I'll explain. Cool, excellent, right. Well, social media is a massive part, obviously, of any kind of meetup um, or any kind of organization nowadays that are trying to kind of increase engagement, influence change, advocate for various different things. So this is where you can kind of play your part in helping us do this. So please use the old hashtags, Digital Taunton or DT Tech. No, that was the, oh, yeah, I pulled that one up. Yeah, it's just DT Tech, no hyphen. Getting some audio feedback over here. Is that all looking dodgy speakers? We don't care. It's all right. Um, so I just want to make you aware, first of all, that um, this is actually being streamed live on YouTube, um, so no swearing. And, um, and also that we've got some photography going on tonight as well. Um, I don't know if that's something that you're not into. If not, I don't know, stick your bag over your head, doesn't it? Um, but, it, you know, let me know if that's... Actually, I don't care. Don't tell me. I wouldn't know what to do with that information. Um, Okie dokie. So first of all, I'm, my name is Shane Griffiths, and I'm a digital product designer at a small uh, and co-founder of a small company called the Idea Bureau. And, uh, and I'm with Ben at the back. Uh, we're part of a small team, a small remote team, but we're based in Taunton, and uh, and we work with people all over the place, uh, designing apps, websites, digital services for uh, not for profits, SMEs. Uh, government, all kinds of different sort of organizations. And, um, and when I'm not doing that, uh, I'm also the director of something called Digital Taunton, um, alongside this handsome chap, Jeremy Hyams, who hopefully, if his kids are tucked in, he'll be watching on the live stream. And, um, and together, we have been running Digital Taunton for exactly a year. It was our, it was our first birthday last week, and, um, and we celebrated that on our other event. And, um, and we're incredibly proud of the kind of impact that we've had already. Um, you know, it's, um, Digital Taunton is, uh, is really important to us. And, uh, and we're really glad that you're here. And hopefully you'll be a continual part of this sort of journey that we've just started. Testing. Done, Tim. Tim, you look guilty. Yeah, it's you. What did you do, Tim? I know. So um, maybe we'll try and sort that out in the break. Um, is this now on? This is on. Okay. Sorry. So as well as myself and Jeremy, we've all we're also kind of uh, supported by um, a really fantastic group of people that give up their time voluntarily and their resources to help make Digital Taunton what it is. And, um, and so, for example, we've got Claims Consortium Group, which, are, which is the, the company that Jeremy runs. 
Um, we've got the UK Hydrographic Office that are um, our partners in digital in the, in the DT Tech event. And, uh, and also the key sponsor for this evening. So thank you ever so much to the Hydrographic Office for the pizzas. This is where we usually clap, give high fives to each other, and it's like, yes, Wednesday pizza. When is that ever a thing? Not in my house. And, um, and uh, also we've got intro tweets who aren't represented here tonight, but Pete's at home on Twitter, pushing it all and, uh, and monitoring what we're all up to. ADPR, they're a fantastic PR company that do a lot of the strategic uh, work for Digital Taunton, as well as a lot of the project management and logistics. We've got uh, a new friend to the family tonight. We've got Highwayman, Highwayman Film Productions. That's uh, Glenn and Matt at the back of the room doing uh, the photography, assisting with uh, some of the video stuff as well. So thank you to you guys. And obviously our host for this evening company. Um, they've, they've been a massive part of our journey right from day one. Uh, and it's amazing what they're able to do for us. So this was a slide that I did a couple of years ago now. And um, so some of you may have already seen this, some of you may haven't already. So essentially, a couple of years ago, this is kind of what I always thought, right? I was incredibly arrogant and, and thought that actually, there's just nothing going on in Somerset and Taunton, and the, especially in the creative tech, sort of entrepreneurial kind of space, there just wasn't anything interesting if you didn't live in Bristol and you didn't live in Exeter. And and uh, and a lot of people think this way, right? I mean, it's it's why you see all the crappy comments on Facebook whenever the Gazette posts something. Well, actually, they all post crap. But you know, it's it's about digital taunting is about celebrating the positive stuff that's going on. And through my journey of digital taunting, I've been made aware by so much energy and and interesting people and businesses doing great things. So there is life south of Bristol, and. Um, and we're like really interested in sort of beating the drum of that. So essentially, uh, we're here to kind of establish Taunton and the surrounding areas as a, as a recognized center of excellence for digital innovation and collaboration. And, um, and we aim to do this by developing and promoting really strong brands, yeah? A lot of this is a marketing thing. And, uh, and what we like to do is work with education and provide that link between industry and education. We uh, see ourselves as kind of evangelists, if you like, for the local digital economy. And, um, and ourselves and through our friends, we look to build relationships and, and work with key stakeholders. Um, key stakeholders. I'm going to track this back to that. And, um, and we kind of bring new ideas to life. We share stories. We get people pumped about living in Taunton and working in tech, right? That's kind of what we're about. And, um, and essentially, you know, we want to co uh, cultivate, I guess, a, a community of highly skilled digital workers uh, who can add value to their businesses and to perhaps others as well. So typically with Digital Taunton, we kind of see... As a narrative, we kind of see these two kind of um, audience types. We have what we define as the people that make technology. That's pretty much, I guess, everyone in this room, right? And the people that use technology. So perhaps uh, marketing people, social media people, business analysts, or people in business. And, uh, and we like to kind of be that sort of um, that, that sweet spot in the middle. Because I believe that it's only when you bring these two audiences together that interesting things can really happen. Um, you know, no one has ever built a product or service where it's just developers, right, or just designers. It's a mix of different people in the business end and also at the tech end. And through that, as I mentioned, we run a series of monthly events, uh, and they're called the Digital Taunton events. And it's every Thursday, every last Thursday of the month. Uh, we've been running them for a year now. Over 100 people always turn up, so it's like this, very similar format, but less space to move, uh, and more pizza, because it's all scaled up, right? And so, you know, it's a free event like tonight, so if you're interested in coming along to those ones, please, please do. We don't care about that. Tonight, we're focused on drilling in a little bit deeper, and that's what DT Tech is about. So DT Tech is defined as one of our fringe events we're putting on. And it allows us to kind of deep dive into the people that make technology and the people that are interested in technology. So we hope that this would 
we would welcome um, a series of, you know, the, the real tech um, seniors and the people that have been around for ages and the, and the students and the newcomers that want to learn as well. And if we can kind of gel all that together, I think we're onto something really, really good. So thanks again for coming. That's me done. Did I keep to my five minutes? No. I couldn't care less. <laughs> I, I've never kept to anything. So um, I'm going to hand over to Sharon now. She's our host for this evening. And, uh, and if anyone wants to kind of check in with me afterwards or say hello or interested in getting involved in the more um, wider digital Taunton picture or in DT Tech in particular, then please let me know. Thank you. Over to Sharon. Thank you, Ebenezer. Hopefully, hopefully I'm mic'd up. Yeah? Cool. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know. He likes to spot mic this time, Shane. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so, yeah, my name is Sharon Lewis, and I'm uh, the organizer of the new um, DT Tech event and your host this evening. So, I hope you enjoy it. Um, the amount of people here tonight is just amazing. Um, when I spoke to Shane and Jeremy about this concept uh, a while ago, I said, you know, I'd be happy with 30 or 40, um, but, you know, we've got 85 signed up signed up tonight. There's quite a few in the room. But mainly uh, what I want to do is say thanks for being brave and not wearing your masks tonight, yeah? So coronavirus has hit London. I was there today. Basically, we um, were in a women in tech conference and a quarter of them already dropped out. Basically, they were, you know, um, drop, well, they didn't drop dead, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Their companies have pulled them from, from traveling. So um, thanks for coming and being brave. Um, and coming tonight. Brilliant. Um, so what I'm trying to um, see around the room is is a mixture, and I'm hoping it's a mixture of people who are really interested in um, uh, coming together and um, having software engineers in the room, having testers in the room, having you know um, UX designers, anybody who is really interested in tech. Um, and this is really a place for you to all meet up, to share ideas, to listen to new concepts, um, and to, to network and get together. Um, and hopefully, this is the event for you. Um, so what we're also trying to do is, is to represent everybody. Um, and although UKHO tonight is sponsoring this event, we obviously want to get more and more of the um, community from Taunton represented here. So what we want to do is obviously get the opportunity for other people to come and sponsor this event as well and have the accolade of free pizza. So we've done that tonight, but obviously, you know, if you know of anybody who really would like to, uh, a local organization who'd like to come and sponsor this in the, in the future, then we don't want it to be the UKHO show. This is about Taunton, this is about everybody. So, you know, come and come and join that and talk to me about that afterwards. Okay. Um, so this is the format for the night. Um, so we've got um, two main speakers, and then we've got a break. So you can have whatever's left of your pizza afterwards and get yourself a drink. And then we've got um, what we call lightning talks. Um, and Dan's my co-host. He'll talk to you about um, the concept of lightning talks when we get to that after the break. Um, so What I'd like to do is obviously um, introduce you to our main speaker tonight, who's John Jagger. Um, John's been um, working with the UKHO for a number of years now, probably five or six years ago. Um, we were looking at our journey into 3D um, uh, test-driven development, and um, uh, our um, developers and our, our delivery teams were were wanting to learn about that, so we brought John into the company, um, and then he's been working with us ever since to um, give us some training for our trainees and the new people into the, into the organization. So um, I know John, he does a really great job. He presents all over the world, he trains, he's a consultant. So big hand for John tonight. Fairly clear. 
hear on the speaker by now. Okay, so I agree with the previous uh, guy who said this is the world's worst UX for uh, moving the slide forward. But anyway, let's see what we can do. <coughs> I guess that's <laughs> one of yours, Sharon, yeah? <laughs> well, should I just skip over it? Okay, fine, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, computer. There we go, that's me. So um, a lot of people, a lot of talkers, speakers spend a lot of time introducing themselves at the beginning. It doesn't turn me on when I'm in your place, so I'm going to talk, talk about who I am at the end. And then if you've been we'll listening a bit more, hopefully. OK. I will say, though, that I'm 34 years old. Uh, but that is in hex. <laughs> and I've been doing software for 40 years, which is in decimal. So I've seen quite a lot of changes. But some things stay the same. That's the title of my talk. Uh, and it's quite deliberately, the words are quite deliberately chosen. Um, I love the equal rights here. I got this image of you know, equal rights for tests, kind of someone walking along equal rights for tests. Well, I'm going to talk about two things in particular. What do I mean by first class? And in particular, what do I mean by equal? What do I mean by testing to be equal? And we'll do that in the first half with a sort of analogy, which hopefully is fairly obvious. And then uh, some actual practical tips that I personally have found useful about uh, how you can use testing in ways that perhaps you hadn't thought of before. So next slide is going to ask you a question. Please don't shout out. Just think about it quietly. So it's probably quite a few thoughts popping around in your head, your heads, as I've asked that question. And if you're like me, your answer was, initial answer at least, was probably something along the lines of this one. And you're probably thinking it was a strange question. And to some degree, it was a leading question, because certainly the way Western languages work, there's a very strong noun-verb correspondence. Yeah? So if I say, what do brakes do? <coughs> I'm inviting you to think of the word break, so you break. And that's, uh, as I say, the way a lot of the way uh, language works in the Western world, Western languages. What do irons do? They iron. What the lights do, they light. You know, Mr. Hoover invents a machine for sucking dirt off the carpet. Well, he's not going to sell very many of them until he comes up with a catchy name for that. And sucking dirt off the carpet isn't going to do it, right? So it becomes Hoover. Hoover and Hoovering noun verb correspondence. And that's true. That is an answer. But I would suggest to you it's not a useful answer. It's not a generative answer. It's not a constructive answer. So that was. It was the question my friend asked me many years ago, and that was the answer I gave instinctively. And he said to me, what I'm telling you now, yes, but not useful, not constructive. This was his answer. And I must admit, at first, I didn't quite get it. But the point, and, and I have to also say, when I first wrote this slide, I put up the words safely and faster. But then I thought, actually, the words safely and faster are redundant in the sense that would you actually drive a car if the car had no brakes? Although, I actually, I do have a friend who drove a car from Brighton to London with only a handbrake, but he is an idiot, <laughs> right? So you can drive, because unless you can stop safely, it's not very sensible to drive safely. And this is, to state the kind of obvious analogy, what I see a fair bit of and my travels as a consultant, although I have to temper that slightly and say that as a consultant, you do tend to get called to places that are in trouble rather than places that are doing well. Okay. If you only concentrate on going fast, things aren't going to end very well. Yeah. If 
you only think about the engine in your car, it's not going to end very well, I would suggest. And this is an example of one of my favorite laws. It's called the law of unintended consequences. Really important law because it states that with the best of intentions, if you are trying to achieve a certain thing, you can very, very easily achieve the opposite thing, whatever that might be. Yeah, There's no malice involved here. It's a systemic law when there are intelligent agents involved in the system. Uh, it's also sometimes called the cobra effect, hence the slide, because of a true story, and there have been many occasions of this throughout history, of um, a plague of cobras in Calcutta during the time of the Raj. And to try and sort this problem out, they put a bounty of uh, some ru 100 rupees, I think, something like that, on the head of a cobra. And for a while, it worked really, really well. The natives were incentivized to go out and find the cobras, bring in the heads, get the money, worked very well, continued to work well. And they thought this shouldn't be going on now, they should all be dead, these cobras. So they sent some people out into the field to find out what's happening, and people were breeding cobras. Yeah? And they said, no, 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 that's not what we meant. So they stopped the bounty. And those people then let the cobras go. Because they only were having the cobras to get the money. They didn't really want to kill the cobras. So many people had been doing this that they ended up with more cobras than when they started. The opposite effect, even with good intention. That's just one example. The same thing happened in Singapore with rats. You could go on and on and on. Really important law. Also hints at the idea of if you want to go fast, sometimes you have to think about that indirectly. Yeah, and that obviously has time with the brakes. You need to think about the brakes if you're thinking about going fast as well. Fast cars have better brakes. Do you want to go faster? More and more companies these days do want to go faster, and they are going faster. And the main reason they can go faster is because they can stop much more quickly. Their automated tests are just amazing. The, the difference I see on my travels in terms of automated testing over the last 10 years is utterly astonishing, really, really astonishing. And I think one of the main reasons for this is that people are motivated. They have now got the motivation to do testing. It may not have been an intended effect, but they want CI and CD. And they've realized that you can't do CD without really good automated tests. Because to kind of state the obvious, if you've got a, pi a CI pipeline, and it's going through with, let's say, 10 commits a day, then all things being equal, it's going to be a balanced system. It's going to be able to cater for 10 commits a day. If you suddenly try and make 200 commits a day, it's going to end badly. The only way you can get 10 times the amount of commits is if you increase the quality by 10 times. Otherwise, it's not going to be a balanced system. Yeah. Heavier vehicles also have better brakes. If you know anything about lorries, you'll know they have a really interesting, different kind of braking system called induction braking. And this is, in general, an example of what's sometimes called the equilibrium law, sometimes also called Le Chatelet's law, after the person who first wrote about it over 100 years ago. This isn't actually what he said. I've paraphrased. Stable systems tend to oppose their own proper function. I didn't understand this when I was younger. And I think, looking back, it was partly because of the word oppose there and the word proper. You're opposing your own proper function? Why, why, why would you be wanting to do that? Hopefully, the, the reasons are becoming clearer. Now, uh, this idea of stability is very important. And a very famous systems theorist called Stafford Beer in the 1970s suggested that it would be a good idea to look at the natural world to find examples of resilient, stable design. Because the natural world's had Living things have been existing on Earth for a best estimate about four and a half billion years. And how right he was. And again, this is making a big change to the way things are happening with, uh, for example, Kubernetes and that kind of stuff. So let's have a quick look at an example of equilibrium law in mammals. So a healthy mammalian body is the result of four and a half billion years of destructive testing. Yeah? What happens when you eat a donut? The amount of glucose in your bloodstream goes up. Some cells in the pancreas detect that, but they don't do anything about it directly. It's a nicely decoupled system. Instead, they secrete insulin. The amount of insulin goes up. The liver and muscles detect that, and that's their trigger to take the glucose and put it in a stored form called glycogen. All very technical, but the point is it's reducing the amount of glucose in your bloodstream because it's converting it to the stored form called glycogen. This has the natural effect of reducing 
the amount of blood, in your sugar, I should say, in your bloodstream, and you don't get hyperglycemic and die, which is a very good thing. But if this happens unchecked, and unchecked is a key word in Scrum, if you know Scrum, okay, then that's not good either because you simply die from a different form. It's not hyperglycemia, it's hypoglycemia. That doesn't happen for the same reason, four and a half billion years of destructive testing. Different cells in the pancreas, they detect that. They secrete a different molecule, liver and muscles detect that. And that's their trigger to reverse the process and take the glycogen and put it back into its regular glucose form. And you've got these two systems. Have we got a laser pointer on this thing? Oh, look at that. Yeah? <laughs> We've got one system here, fighting, 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 tremendous activity in this system, and tremendous activity in this system as well, and both of them are activity, fighting, fighting, activity, all this activity, fighting, fighting against each other all the time. Why? To keep something else the same. And I find that a deeply beautiful and deeply paradoxical relationship. This is one of my, fa my favorite books. It's not specifically about software at all. Um, it's about family therapy, interestingly. I'm going to do what they say never to do, quote from a slide. <laughs> all change can be understood as the effort to maintain some constancy, and then all constancy as maintained through change. I find that really interesting. In other words, if you, in this crazy world of ours, find something that isn't changing, this is a fairly good indicator that there's probably some stuff happening to keep it from not changing. Yeah. It is the very act of these two com competing forces fighting against each other, which is what is generating and maintaining and stabilizing the system. And this is a scale-free phenomenon. We've just seen it there in a single ma mammalian body. It works at all scales. Simple example, bats have sonar echolocation so they can detect moths and things like that. If there's a mutation and the bat can suddenly emit a stronger sonar, for example, yeah, they can see the bats from further away. See, not see, hear, the word. they can hear the bats from further away, yeah. But similarly, the bats can probably hear them from further away, yeah, because it's a reactive system. They are always in opposition to each other, yeah. All that's happening is that you're putting pressure on the system for the moths to evolve better hearing so that they can counteract that system. Otherwise, it's not going to keep its stability. And apart from anything else, they're going to regulate each other in terms of their numbers, as is always the case, because the bats eat the moths, and if they do too good a job, there's not going to be many bat, uh, moths left, and that means there's not going to be many bats left either. Okay? So it's a self-regulating system. So in, as Charles Darwin might have said, but didn't, Evolution is always co-evolution. Yeah, I really wish I'd taught that when I was younger at secondary school. That would have been for me quite an enlightening thing, I think. There's always opposition to keep stability. So another quote from another book I love. <coughs> Interesting subtitle from this book is The Learning Organization. This came out again in the 70s, very prescient. The learning organization, you want a sort of summary of software development, you want to maximize the learning and minimize the complexity, right? It is an axiom that influences both the cause and effect. Nothing is ever influenced in just one direction. Yeah, if you think you know that A is causing B, you're probably suffering from a causation fallacy. Yeah, it's more likely that the two things are in some kind of intertwined dance and you just haven't quite seen the depth of the interaction yet. If you want to know why I've put buses in the background here, ask me afterwards and I'll tell you another thing about Scrum. So to pick an example, <coughs> if you miss your deadlines, is that because you've got bugs? Or do you miss your bugs because you've got deadlines or vice versa? Which way is it? Both of them, all the time. They're dancing around each other all the time. Okay, and while we're here, let's just pick on some words because the words you use are very, very important. They reflect the the thinking of the people who are saying these things, obviously, yeah? The word deadline, just think about that word, deadline. Yeah, do you know the origin of the, dead the word deadline? There's two theories, but one of the theories is that it comes from the American Civil War, when there was literally a line drawn 17 meters from the camp, which was a prisoner of war camp, and if you crossed that line, you were dead. And this is the terminology we use, okay? While we're at it, let's do the same for bugs. Bugs. Yeah, we didn't create these errors. 
what they are, errors, right? No, no, they, they have a life of their own and they just creep in all by themselves. It's not my fault. Okay, this is what we're saying, yes? And while we're at it, let's pick on a few other words like sprint. Terrible word that is. Yeah? A professional sprinter sprints for 10 seconds and it takes them 10 minutes for full recovery. That's 1 60th of the time actually doing the burning of the calories, right? Yeah? So to make the obvious point, as I of this talk, I'm suggesting that coding and testing be thought of as equal first class citizens in a co-evolving system in the same way that I've been describing. They're not the same, they are different. The styles we employ in these two aspects of writing software are different, but they are nevertheless as important as each other because of the way that they affect each other in a dynamic, evolving way. And more and more, as I said, this is happening. People are doing the testing for the reasons I've suggested, maybe. But to be honest, the testing is still a second-class citizen, at least in terms of the thinking. In other words, it's kind of not so much thought about, and it's off to the side slightly. Okay? Now you may think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. We're more like this one. Well, mm, let's see. So how do you call a function? Some technical things now. How do you call a function? It's not a trick question. How do you call a function? Supposing the function is called Wibble, how do you call it? You name it, yeah? What about if it's a test function? How do you call a test function? Yeah, not so obvious, is it now? Because normally you don't have to call your test function, the test runner does it for you. What happens if you've got a thousand tests and one of them is causing a problem in your CI CD pipeline? Yeah? And to run that one test, you find you have to run all of the thousand to get it through the pipeline. What you want to do is just at the command line say, just run this one when you go through the pipeline. You want to name that one test in the pipeline. Good luck. Okay. Here's a gem that you can use if you happen to be using Ruby to run the particular test function that lives on line five of this file. Ah. Yeah. It's not the way I want to do it. But this is quite common. Not for me, it's not, okay? I take the time and the effort to put little wrappers around my test framework use, okay? I think this kind of ability is very important. We value the abstraction mechanisms we have in the source. We should value the same mechanisms in the tests, okay? So here's an idea. Just give your tests some kind of identifier, okay? That happens to be a hex identifier. And I can specify that identifier. Where it lives, the name of the file can change, yeah? The text that forms the, the string, which is associated with the lambda in this style of the test framework, okay? I can change that as much as I like. In other words, we've got the decoupling. You can run what you want to run when you want to do it. Not like this. But this is an echo of tests, second class citizens, okay? Do you measure coverage? I suppose you are, I mean, I'm assuming you are doing some testing. Do you measure coverage? Yeah, people nodding. Yeah? You don't know what I'm asking yet. Okay, coverage of what? We've got two kinds of sorts. We've got the code. We've got the tests. Yeah, acting against each other. Do you measure the coverage of the tests? You're probably thinking, eh? What? You measure the coverage of the tests? Why would you do that? Why would you not do it? Right? Well, one reason you might not do it is because most of the test frameworks, if you try and do it, they'll say, no, 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 okay? You have to battle sometimes to get this to work. I have to arrange my tests and my source in a directory structure like this off the root because it's volume mounted because of Docker container stuff, okay? And this is the only way, uh, the best way I can think of doing it given that the actual container is a read-only container, okay? And I'm on 0 0.17 of the gem for this particular test framework. And I can't upgrade because the upgrade breaks this. It cannot handle this, okay? Common, 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 this kind of thing. Do you aim for 100% coverage, anyone? Anyone aim for 100% coverage? Well, again, you don't know what I'm asking. Am I asking 100% coverage for the code or the tests? Right? Yeah? 
Now, 100% coverage is probably a stretch if you haven't done it from the beginning. If you've done it from the beginning, it's trivial, okay? But if you haven't done it from the beginning, the system is going to resist you, except if it's the tests. It is trivially easy to make sure you've got 100% coverage for the tests, yeah? And I've been doing this for my open source uh, project called CyberDojo, which has been going just over a decade now. And there was one thing I learned from starting to do this, which was, for me, a surprise. And it was such a useful lesson. I wonder if anyone can guess what it was. Here's a clue. In other words, dead code. Yes. OK? In other words, what I found unexpectedly was that uh, keeping 100% coverage for the tests was useful because of what dropped to 99.9. .9. Two reasons that can happen. Number one, you've missed the test. OK? But another reason is there's dead code in the tests. Yeah? Normally, it's dead code in the tests in this particular situation. This is, can be really important. Yeah? In the 1970s, there was a company called Knight Trading that not traded, used to trade on the New York Stock Exchange. They had C++ code base that did automated trading, loaded dead code inside it. There was a, un an undefined behavior event on, on their trading system at one point. The program counter jumped into the dead code, and it started automatically trading from code that hadn't been run in years. And the net result was they lost hundreds of millions of dollars in half an hour, and they no longer exist. OK? This stuff matters. Something else you can do, once you have this idea of the code and the tests being equal, and if you do something in terms of software to the code, you can at least think about doing the same thing to the tests, yeah? is to compare the two. So using that little gem I mentioned earlier, for my open source framework, as I said, I have two tabs at the top here, one for the tested code, yeah, matching the regex you saw, and one for the tested code, which is what's being targeted. Yeah? And what I find interesting is that we can look at the various metrics that are being gathered for these two different values. The hits per line, yeah, and the hits per line here, those are real different. Yeah? And also the number of lines, also quite different. And this is useful information. We've got uh, probably about twice as many lines of code as we have in the tests as we have in the code. And that's normal and healthy, yeah, for various reasons that we probably haven't got time to go into just now. But the hits per line is a really interesting one. Lots of people, well, not lots of people, but some people, some de developers, measure cyclomatic complexity to try and get a handle on the complexity of the code. I think that's a pretty poor measure. There's all kinds of reasons why I think it can be a poor measure, OK? But this one allows you to have, as I said, a, a ratio of the two. The hits per line, if you think about it, is a really quite interesting measure of the difference in complexity between the tests and the code. Yeah, two ways you could think about this. You could say that the tests are about seven times simpler than the code, or that the code is about seven times more complex than the tests. Either way, we should have some confidence here that the tests are radically simpler than the code. Because if the tests are not radically simpler than the code, you've got a big, big problem, yeah? Because to kind of state the obvious, you've got more, you can easily end up with more bugs in the tests than you can in the code. That's the price you pay for the linearity of the tests, which is correspondingly why you tend to have more lines of code in the tests as opposed to the code under test. Because you're not comparing like for like. Like I said, these things are different things, okay? And again, to reiterate that idea, that if you're doing something in terms of software with the code, think about doing it for the tests as well. Treat it as an equal first-class citizen. You could think about the duration. How long does it take the tests to run? They have to pass. That's not the question. How long do they take to run? Yeah. The answer is going to go up and up and up and up and up with a growing system. Yeah. And then you have the problem of accommodation, because the changes are so small you don't see them. Yeah, you have to be really, really careful about that. So I'm basically out of time now. I think we've got a few minutes for questions if anyone's got any. That's all I had prepared. Any questions?
questions? I'm not seeing anything, so I think we're good. That's fine. You can always grab me for a drink or ask me uh, when I'm having a pizza or whatever it might be. Yeah, it's great. Leave it there, yeah? Thank you. Are we okay for mics? Yeah. The noise seems to have come down now. I've given it a kick. Great. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So next up is Kieran. So Kieran's been with the Hydrographic Office for two or three years. Longer? Yeah. So started as an intern. It's done really well. Software developer and now into um, data engineering. So he's going to tell us all about satellite imagery, data collection, and what he's doing with it. Round of applause for Kieran. Feel like I'm looking. Can you hear me? Okay. Feel like I'm Britney Spears with this thing on. Uh, yep, so. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, talking to everyone about how we uh, have created what we believe to be the best high resolution global data set of mangrove coverage. Um, the UKHO, it was a joint project between three teams mainly. Um, so it was the remote sensing team, so our experts in labeling, uh, like digitizing imagery, um, data engineering, the team I'm in, and data science as well. Um, if you're wondering what this horrible green neon mess is at the back, um, that's an area of mangrove uh, called the Sundarbans. It's across the Bangladesh and Indian border. Uh, it's about not so much like Britney Spears anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and if you want to have an idea of how big mangrove forests can be, this is about double the size of as well. So it's a pretty big area. Um, lots of tigers and stuff like that in there. So why mangrove? Why did the hydrographic office who do charting in the ocean make a data set on mangrove? Very good question. Here's a video. As you can see here, big wavy ocean on a small scale, mangroves on another small scale. And then we've got our coastline here. As you can see, the water is pretty much still. Um, turns out mangroves are an incredible um, blocker for coastal erosion, stuff like that. Um, I found this lovely graphic from the German government on good reasons for mangrove. So it's three to five times higher at, um, requesting carbon dioxide than a tropical rainforest, so much better than the Amazon. Um, other stuff, so they're great for fisheries, great for filtration of water. The main one is the coastal protection, so they're incredible for that. So for the project, we wanted to go global. Um, we didn't want to spend much money. Um, and for global data for satellite imagery, there's only kind of, you've got Landsat, um, but we chose to go with Sentinel-2, so that's a, a satellite program from the European Space Agency. It gives optical imagery around the world. It covers most areas of land every five days or so. Um, and also we use the shuttle radar topography, which came out of 2000 um, from NASA. It's basically a digital elevation model, so height data, and we use that as well. So mangrove kind of happens sort of around the equator, sort of warm regions where there's actually nice weather rather than Taunton. Um, <laughs> to create the data set, uh, what happened was we picked um, gold standard locations. So we gave those to the remote sensing team and they digitized that with their expertise. Then we had the training data locations, which the data science team also labeled. So we trained the data, trained the model on the training data, and then we tested it against the gold standard to see, you know, could we match a remote sensing expert? Um, we picked 60 areas, so 30 gold standard, 30 training areas. You kind of get a rough idea. We tried to get pretty much around the world. So these are the technologies the data science team use at the Hydro. Um, if you're familiar with data science or machine learning, you've probably noticed some of these technologies. Uh, AWS was a nice one, so we got to use the cloud, so someone kind of gave us a credit card and was like, off you go. Always handy. Um, there's a few fancy geospatial libraries, so we had fun with GDAO and we're using QGIS to visualize some of the data. Um, big one for the data science team when they started the project was a framework called MLflow, so it gave them a better chance to reproduce their experiments with their models. It gives you good track of the metadata and the parameters you give to the models. Um, so what do I mean by training a model? Um, I'll use this diagram next to explain it. 
that Torque did. So it's really simple. Make your model, give it a bit of data, feed it, give it some more data. After a while, you give it an image, and it goes, oh, there you go, and you've got that. That's the happy, nice, friendly way of describing it. What really happened is data science made something like this. It's called a UNAT. Um, it's a really popular model for image segmentations. It's been used quite well to identify cancer cells and stuff in imagery. Um, essentially, what it is is just a big long line of arrays. Um, that's the best way I can explain it. But essentially, you put in your image at the start here, and it compresses it down, compresses it down. And then around about this area, it kind of, you have a lot of small images that represent different features in an image. And then it goes back up this U, and then you get a classification out of the end of it. So deep learning, which is what the model is, um, is kind of like a black box kind of technology. And sometimes it's really hard to actually know what the model is doing. So what data science did was quite a few experiments. So we, uh, with the bands of the images we passed in, so you get red, green, blue, infrared, stuff like that. What data science did was they blanked out some of the bands to check that the model was actually using them. So we used predictions based on blanked out bands. So as you can see here, we've got the actual image. It's in a funny color because of Python. Uh, we've got the label from what, uh, how data science labeled the imagery and then the prediction. So it kind of looked pretty good. What happened then is we removed different bands. So basically just zeroed out the bands to make sure that actually if we blanked out a band, the prediction should look different just so that we know we're using all the data and we're not wasting computing time. We did more things for demystifying the model. So as you can see here, I've got all the bands visualized uh, from an image that you'd get from the Sentinel-2 platform. And then we look at the last layer of the model to see what kind of inference it's making. So you can see here that some in the yellow, it's identifying quite a big river channel. Others, it's there's a weird one somewhere. Here, so you can it's filtering out just the small little water channels. And then other areas where it's kind of around the edges, it's actually learning what mangrove is. So it's really nice to see that the model is actually differentiating between land, water, mangrove. And it's not just kind of guessing and luckily getting it right. So how did we do? So once data science trained the model and spent lots of money on AWS doing that, we had to check how we did. Um, one of the data sets that we used to kind of verify this was uh, a data set called Global Mangrove Watch. It came out in around 2010. It's pretty low resolution. It's kind of an amalgamation of lots of data sets from different various scientific studies. Um, so some of the data is kind of hairy. Some areas are just mangrove for miles. So this is an area in Indonesia. What you can see here is what Global Mangrove Watch said was uh, mangrove. So if I go back, you can see here now that in the image that we've taken here, a lot of fields here, whereas Global Mangrove Watch, when it was covered, all that was mangrove. Um, so it's quite a good way to pick out deforestation as well. So these were the labels that the remote sensing team made in green. So you can see that remote sensing picked out that there's been deforestation. And then the next slide is how we did for the model. So it was kind of pretty, pretty dead on. We're pretty happy with it. We've got another area here, which is in Australia. So again, Global Mangrove Watch basically said all of Australia is mangroves. <laughs> Remote sensing, we're a bit smarter about that and said, actually, no, these bits are mangroves. And then we use the model again. We go, oh, yeah, we kind of agree with remote sensing. So we uh, coined a term in the team uh, called ge geogeneralizability. That's a real mouthful. Um, and what we wanted to prove is that we could make a model, one model, that could scale across the globe and it would work everywhere. Um, we printed lots of different statistics. Um, data science know all about that. But essentially, some of the statistics, uh, you know, if we classified mangrove and it wasn't mangrove, we get a different score. Whether our labels overlap with other labels, do they work? What we really wanted was, rather than having one area of the world where everything did really well, we were happy if it did OK around the world, because then it means that we made something generalizable and we could scale it up. So once we had the model, that was all fine and dandy, but Predicting on one image kind of takes a manual, a long time manually. So what happened is the data engineering team were involved. Um, I'm going to show you a pipeline in the next slide, but I'll explain what all the icons mean on here. Um, so we query the European Space Agency Open Access Hub. And basically, that just gives us loads of metadata about imagery, when the latest image was, if it was cloudy or not. We have the SRTM, so that's where we get the DEM model. Uh, we used S3 to store the data. We used DynamoDB to track per tile, so per satellite image, we chip it up into chips. 
And for each one of those chips, we actually record what image it came from, whether there was cloud in there, how cloudy it was, whether there was no data. So the way the satellite image, or the satellite takes images, sometimes a square satellite image might not have anything in it, or might have a little bit in the corner, just by how it orbits. We use Lambda as our compute platform of choice. Um, some people might say, oh, like geospatial and machine learning and lambdas usually use those like sub millisecond kind of communications. We were like, nah, we're gonna push that. We we'll, uh, make like 15 minute long lambdas, that was fun. Um, <laughs> so then we have lambda layers, we'll cover those in a bit. Uh, we used SNS just to orchestrate, so sending messages between the lambdas to kick off the pipeline. And obviously we had to encompass TensorFlow because that's how the data science uh, folks package the model. So this is it, ooh, the pipeline. So we'll start off here, so find images. Essentially this queries the data set, uh, queries the European Space Agency for the latest cloud-free image. And if we can't get a cloud-free image, we'll get the least cloudiest image. Joy of optical imagery is if there's a cloud there, you can't see through it. Whereas if you use something like radar imagery, it will go through the clouds, but we didn't use that. Uh, <laughs> so then for any tile that we give, we retrieve the DEM square and we package them because that's another tile that the model requires. Then we retrieve all the optical bands that the model uses, so RGB, infrared, et cetera, et cetera. Then once we've got all those bands, we all then stack them up, and then we've got this massive satellite tile, and we chip that up. So um, a Sentinel tile is about 11,000 by 11,000 pixels. We split that up into chips of 256 by 256 pixels. So per satellite image, you get about 1,800 smaller images out. You can kind of see that as you go across the world, you're just extrapolating that data hugely. Then we pass it through to the model. So we pass it through the TensorFlow model, that predicts. Then we combine those predictions. So once we've got all those small chips out, we then package those back into a big image. And then we publish the data set. So we just reproject it into a, date, to a projection that's useful for our internal customers. Layers, woo. Can I just get a Shrek gift? <laughs> um, so one of the big, not downsized, limitations of Lambda is that if uh, so we were using Python. Um, you're just using Lambda and Python straight out of the box. You only get the inbuilt Python libraries that you'd get in a normal Python install. Um, so to get around that, um, AWS provides something called uh, Lambda layers. Um, so if you're uploading code to Lambda, you get a maximum of 50 meg to upload your package. Um, but you do get 250 megs of unzipped space, including your code. So what you can do is you can install your packages on, we did it via Docker, um, build it against the Lambda OS, and then zip them up, and then you can upload them as well. So then it's kind of like a layer underneath your Lambda code that you can use external dependencies. It means that we can do stuff like deep learning in something that really shouldn't have deep learning in it. Um, the way we went about that was uh, this really nice person called Anton Paquin made a TensorFlow Lambda layer, so deep learning, that was done. Tick, the hardest thing in the world, done. Someone else did it for us. Um, <laughs> For the Lambda, for the um, geospatial stuff, we had to build against GDAO, and if anyone's ever done geospatial stuff, they'll know GDAO is the biggest pain in the backside in the world, um, because it basically has to be built against every OS it's running against. Luckily, there's a uh, remote sensing company somewhere in Canada that had done the hard work of building GDAO, and then essentially all we had to do was install our packages on top of that. Uh, if anyone does want to do geospatial stuff with Lambdas, Python, it's a very specific use case, I understand, but we do have a layer that you can use if you ever want to do that. Wrong way. Testing, lucky. Um, so again, we didn't want to spend a lot of money, so we didn't want to run loads and loads of tests live. Um, so we found a library called LocalStack, or the bee's knees. Um, <laughs> essentially, it's just the entirety of 90% well, of the AWS offering locally running in a Docker container. Um, it's just built around loads of mocking libraries, so the project just brought them all together. And essentially, as far as your code's concerned, it's looking at AWS when it's running. Um, they've been doing incredible work. So they've, it's an open source uh, package, but they're going freemium at the moment. Uh, but all the stuff that we needed to predict across the globe is still in the freemium, in the free open source version, so that was great. So this is what it looks like at the end. Uh, we predicted on about 1,600 different areas of the world. We did that twice, so it's almost 4,000 satellite images. I've got some stats somewhere. It's about 16 million squared kilometers of imagery. And I figured out that was 70 times the size of the UK of mangrove imagery that we uh, predicted on. Uh, and with the two runs of the data set we did over a week, 
that gave us about 90% coverage of the data set. So everywhere that we said we could predict on mangrove, we got 90% coverage. The only reason why it's so low is mangroves, mangroves love to grow in tropical areas. And unfortunately, there's lots of clouds. Um, some areas, just cloudy all the time. Um, but essentially, what, the, what we can do with the pipeline is we can run it again. And as soon as we get a cloud-free image, we patch in that image. Oh, mangrovey. Um, <laughs> so we've zoomed in a bit here, so you can see some nice, vibrant colors here. Um, so the top is uh, the coast of Kenya. Again, we've got the Sundarban in the middle, and then we've got Australia on the, sa on the bottom. Uh, to give the data out into the business, we went two ways. So we've got some internal customers that need offline access to this. We're a defense organization, so some people need this data when they can't get an internet connection. Uh, we managed to package it down into an ArcGIS project into about three gigs. So it's like the entire globe's worth of mangrove in three gigs. Um, people are happy with that. They can stick that on a USB stick and take it away on a laptop. Um, for the people in the office that actually have the, you know, the wonders of the internet, uh, we packaged it up into a GDAO vert file, which is essentially just a big XML document that goes, okay, spatial area, go to this area of uh, AWS, and it will download it. So when people are panning across the globe looking at the imagery, it doesn't download the whole globe for them. It will just load the bit they're interested in. So what happened and what's happening now? Um, so we did some more investigation. So uh, AWS offering called SageMaker. It's their machine learning offering on the cloud. Um, we gave it a go. Turns out it's pretty hard to do when you've already got a model. So the AWS way of life is kind of get you in at the start and trap you there and never leave AWS, never go anywhere else. Unfortunately, we'd already done all the model training outside of AWS, so it was really hard to kind of bring it onto SageMaker. Um, it's also really expensive. So if you can, avoid it. <laughs> um, if I go back, no. Uh, so you can see here in the Sundaban, there's some areas here which are very clearly mangrove, which we've missed. Um, we found some more scientific papers that have done some research. And as you can kind of see here, it's around this area where we missed. So, um, there are many different species of mangroves, and it just so happened that we hadn't trained the model on this one species. So it's quite nice to see that A, we'd learned different species, and also B, that it was quite clear cut that we'd missed that one out. So for the next generation of the model, we can train more on those areas, which means hopefully around the world we won't miss more mangroves. Uh, what's happened now and what we're currently doing? So rather than SNS, which was kind of just periodic and it went end to end for the pipeline, uh, we've now used step functions to orchestrate the pipeline. And it gives us a bit more resilience. So if something fails, we can just retry it. We can also get these nice charts of how the pipeline's done. Um, so we don't have to wire up a horrible CloudWatch dashboard to say, okay, this function didn't invoke this one. We can kind of flow through and we can see something failed here. Ah, yes. Cool. Um, <laughs> so it turns out during the uh, generation of the pipeline for the mangrove data set, we essentially just made a generic chip up optical imagery, pump it through a model and pop out a data set at the end. So the idea being is anyone comes along and says, great, I've got a model that finds puffins in satellite imagery or buses or something like that. We can plug in and generate a global data set with pretty much with ease. Oh, that's me done. Uh, we found a heart with mangrove. Um, <laughs> it's a nice, cute little way to finish. Um, yeah, if you're interested in any of the other technical stuff that we do, we do have a Medium blog. It isn't behind the table, so don't worry. You won't get ads or asked to join up. You, just, you can read those for free. Uh, we've got kind of the more official government one, which doesn't have as many emojis in the blogs, but you can still read those. That's me done. take questions. Do we have anyone with questions? Yes, we do. Cool. Just go to this gentleman here first. Do you want to have the red mic? Milo can't ask a question. He works there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said you ran it twice. Is there scope for having it um, pull the data set and work out when it can gain an image that it doesn't already have? So you said there's some images that are always cloudy. Could you keep polling until you found a correct image? And could you poll to keep your images up to date to a certain extent? So yeah, there's definitely that. So um, the data is uh, 
uploaded by another company onto S3, and you can get no notifications from that bucket as soon as a new image comes in. So we could have it just sat there waiting for notifications, and as soon as an image comes in, we just pump it through, and if it's better, we plug it into the data set. If not, we just chuck it out and wait for the next one. Money and time. <laughs> cool, we did have a question at the front there. Yeah. Hi there. Um, that kind of leads on to my question, really, uh, which was, did you come up with, like, obviously, because you're government funded, what restrictions did you have in terms of budget, and did you did you come up against that a lot? Um, so we're kind of lucky in the fact that we're a trading fund, so we kind of make our own money, and we have a, we kind of do have a bit more freedom to spend it. But in generating the first data set, we spent about 200 bucks in total, like, actually generating it. That doesn't cover the data science training costs you guys went off the roof with the price of that bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, essentially, for running lambdas, the pipeline, I don't think we actually got charged for any of the lambdas because we were in the three million requests. Um, the S3 storage cost was kind of up there and the DynamoDB cost were. Um, but because it's serverless, we haven't got anything running constantly, so it, we only get charged for what we use. Um, and because we're storing the predictions, they're a lot smaller than the full satellite images, so we're quite lucky with that. No, it didn't restrict us. We were mindful of it. We obviously didn't want to turn up one and go, oh, crap, we spent like four grand in a day, but we didn't. In the middle, yeah. Um, uh, so you stated some of the uh, importance of mangrove trees at the start. Um, now you found this data set, what are you going to do with it uh, to sort of highlight those important things that mangroves do? That's a really tough question, right? I have to, have to put my business head on. Currently, it is an internal data set. Uh, we are doing a second run of it. I'm just going to watch Bernadette as she nods or shakes her head when I say something. We would like to make it open source. I personally would. Um, we have a commercial side of the business, which kind of has a control on what goes out. Um, if people are really interested in it, I would just say just spam the people that are in charge of giving out that data, and then that kind of, it's more of a, if we have the interest externally, then we're more likely to open it up to the outer world. We have helped some researchers and given them small bits of the data set. So watch this space. Yeah, start, start writing emails. I think there's still some more. I could have asked you this at home, but oh well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm his girlfriend, it's not weird. Um, Given that obviously sea level rise is a big thing, can you predict, obviously mangroves are right at the edge of an island or land. Are you predicting if when the um, bang goes over it, if the sea level is high or low at that point and can you predict baby mangroves? So I'll tackle those in different parts. Uh, sea level rise is a different thing. You can do, uh, you can kind of, I'd suggest yes, you could probably do it. Uh, I'm trying to think how to answer that. No, we didn't measure the sea level. Uh, there are ways you can figure out the tide around those areas. So there are ways that we could map, OK, we knew this image was taken at this time. We have a rough idea of what the tide level would be there. Um, can we predict baby mangrove? No. So I didn't mention the resolution of the, da the data set. So it's 10 meters. So each picture you see is 10 meters. So if we have found mangrove, it's 10 by 10 meters of mangrove. If baby mangroves do grow up, the big, big strong mangroves, then yes, we'll find them. Um, so there are areas where they're planting baby mangroves, which is really nice. Um, we did have one area where someone had actually gone around with a backpack and geotracked um, mangrove as ground truth. Just so happens it's in the middle of nowhere in a tiny island, and the one sentinel image that was actually in the catalog for the time period was completely cloudy, uh, which was really annoying because we couldn't actually verify with perfect ground truth that uh, we found them correctly. I think we're going to call the questions there. Um, Kieran will be around, I guess, um, eating be dry, cold pizza with the rest of you um, for further questions after this. Do you just want to wrap up? So, I hope you enjoyed that. That's our... Um, our format in terms of uh, main speakers, and we hope to replicate that in the months to come as well. So um, it's 10 minute break. See you in a minute.
Hello, Taunton. Cool. Um, if we can get everyone back in the back room, please. Has everyone been to enough kind of techie conferences that this kind of thing gets attention? Or is that just something I know and I look silly now? Okay, I look silly. Great. <laughs> Put your hand up. You're going to get tickled. Oh. Okay. <laughs> We're all back in the room now? Right. Okay, so you're going to have to indulge me with a complete mistake I did earlier um, and completely forgot about being the sponsor for this evening. And so... I'm going to have to play our video. So uh, I went to a conference recently, um, and it was a civil service conference, and I sat next to five people, and I basically said, who is the hydrographic office? And they were civil servants, we were part of the civil service, and they didn't even know what we did. So I'm really keen for you guys to know who we are. We're a big employer in, in Taunton, um, and you know we're quite a large tech organization. You've seen some of the things we've done today. So I'm just going to play this little video for you just to see the breadth of stuff that we do. Within everyone lies a passion for adventure. It's a passion that inspires us. For over 200 years, we've been on our own adventure, charting the world's oceans and providing the information mariners need to navigate them safely. Now we endeavor to broaden our horizons to take us into exciting new territory, pushing our boundaries to meet the needs of the world. By 2030, the global blue economy will be worth $3 trillion. We can provide the knowledge and expertise to support this growth. We want to further the blue economy by making the most of the marine environment in a sustainable, responsible manner. Developing infrastructure, supporting design of resilience, nurturing aquaculture, increasing tourism, empowering bioengineering, and facilitating global trade. As the government's marine geospatial data experts, we will enable users to unlock opportunities and pioneer new ground. We will harness new technology to provide global data that furthers our knowledge of the marine environment. From satellites high above the Earth, to deep below the seabed, our reach now stretches further than previously thought possible. We have a quest for knowledge, a spirit of discovery, and an ambition to be the world's leading marine geospatial information agency and hydrographic office. Together, we are unlocking a deeper understanding of the world's oceans for safer navigation, for the marine economy, and for the future of our planet. Pretty cool, hey? So um, when we talk about the hydrographic office, we're sort of, um, people know about the audience survey. Uh, you know, they, they map the, the, the land. So we obviously chart the oceans, but we do a lot more, you know, you can see from the video. So that was the word from the sponsor, and that's obviously something that we're keen to get other people coming and sponsoring us, and they'll get a two-minute slot. They'll get the, the actual voice to show what they do as well. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to Dan now, who's going to do the lightning talks. While I sort out the IT, do you just want to tell everyone how they can get hold of you? Yeah, okay, so let's have a look. So we've got, I forgot as well, um, we've got a link to um, <laughs> uh, we're recruiting. So, and that's one of my main, main roles. I completely forgot about that. Um, so basically, um, I'm here to make sure that you're aware of everything we do. We're, we're um, highlighting some of the things we're doing here today. Um, and if you follow that link and keep an eye on what we're doing, then we've got some roles out there. And obviously, if you want to ask any questions, then I'm around as well afterwards. Okay. Okay, just bear with me. I've got to find the right slide again. Try not to spoil it by showing anything we haven't already seen. Nearly hit the Shrek one. Well, there we are. Nearly there. 
too far, in fact. Lightning talks. So when we were organizing this evening, um, we are like, how can we get a bit more involvement from the people attending and things like that? And when it's the first event, that's pretty hard. So we thought we can, we can do a bit of upfront work. We know a, a few tech people willing to do kind of five minute talks, that sort of thing around what they want to do. And we thought we could also bring that kind of context into maybe something we can do in the future as well. So maybe, you know, you've got something you want to talk about. Um, helps if I've got this. So what, I, what is a lightning talk? Why, why we want to do it? So it's a way to share a topic with the community. It's around five minutes. We're going to go with around that. I'm not going to be horrible to the speakers and cut them off and come and stand in front of them. And it's not a sales pitch. You're not up here for five minutes to go buy this thing. It's great. It's about technology. Um, why do it? Well, we can open a conversation. That's pretty cool. Um, we want to share concepts. We want to share a bit of learning or learn together. Um, and also, maybe improve your speaking. Maybe you're looking to Digital Taunton. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I could step up and do one of their talks. Um, doing one of these, that's going to open you a really good conversation with the Digital Taunton folks. So maybe this is an opportunity as well. Um, this one's mainly for the speakers. So not everyone will find this easy. And I just wanted to ask everyone, let's be generous and kind to our speakers. Now, I know we're all going to be doing that. But if you're going to think about coming up, you just need to know that that's a thing. Um, and that's it. I don't want to hog the glory. We're going to go over to our speakers. This is Ryan. <laughs> I have to warn you, we're going to have to get the whole technology thing in the middle of this, because he he's going to want to show some code. So. Hi, I'm Ryan. Um, uh, I work at ADP, a software engineer in Bristol. Um, and uh, tonight I'll be talking you through a uh, testing technique called proxy and record testing. Uh, my team uses it in ADP, and I'll be going through some of the benefits of using this kind of technique. So uh, this is the problem space. We've got a series of lambdas, um, but they could be any service, really. Uh, they have inputs and outputs. Uh, and at the end of this series of lambdas, we've got a third-party API. Um, each of the messages uh, that go between each of these services must be of a certain shape and have some required data. So we can call those requirements the contract between those two services. Uh, these, uh, there are a number of methods for managing internal contracts for services that we develop uh, in our own company. Uh, those can be shared model classes, multi-service integration tests, or end-to-end -end tests. Shared model classes, they're easy. Um, multi-service integration tests, they give you a bit more of a, a robust way of testing that two services work together quite well. Um, and end-to-end -end tests are the slowest, most expensive way of doing that, but they uh, are good for a final sanity check before deploying to production. Now, managing external contracts is a bit harder. So you can't often set up uh, a third-party API uh, as part of a multi-service integration test. Um, and unless the developer of the API provides you a model uh, class library or a client library, then you're kind of stuck without that as well. So that kind of leaves end-to-end -end tests, which are slow and they take ages to run. And the problem with that is that waiting for the end, te end test to run to verify your contract between two services uh, means you don't fail fast, and this is expensive and time-consuming. So, the answer is to use the real API, but just once. And you can do this through proxy and record testing. So there are a number of tools that exist for this kind of testing. Uh, there's wiremock.net for .NET Core. There's NOC, which I'll be going through in a second, for JavaScript and TypeScript. And then there's wiremock for Java. Uh, there's also Ruby for, uh, sorry, VSR for Ruby. So I'll be going on to the demo now. This should be interesting. Good.
Cool. Okay, so I've set up a small framework um, to test an API. Uh, so I can run a curl command here just to show you that the API is running. Uh, it just gives you a type of banana um, and the number of number of that type of banana. Um, if we imagine that's a third party API and there's no client for it, so I want to write a client. Sorry, I know some of you at the back can't quite see that. Um, so here's the test code. Uh, we can see that I've set up knock in order to record here. Uh, I've set the fixture directory to where, for where it records to, and I've uh, enabled it to connect to the internet. And then the test itself is just expecting that our client, when called, uh, produces the expected body outside of it. Now, if I run these tests, uh, this should fail because we've not implemented the client yet in the spirit of TDD. Cool. Uh, so you can also see that knock uh, in the fixture has recorded no requests. That means my client made no requests, no HTTP interactions were made. Luckily, implementing the uh, client is gonna be quite quick because someone's left this uh, commented code for me. So uh, if I implement that very quickly, actually our old fixture, and run the tests again, you can see that the test now passed. Now what Knox is taking that HTTP request that's been made, proxied it through itself, recorded the request, uh, then gone off to the real API and recorded the response back from that. So that means what I can do now is close down the API. Let's imagine, I don't know, you're developing on the train and you don't have access to the internet. If I run it again, the tests will pass again because it's proxied back the original response and it never went to the real API this time. Cool. So if we swap that back. So I'm just gonna run you through some of the benefits of this approach. Has that gone too far? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not too far, okay, cool. Uh, so there's a number of benefits to this approach. You've got optional regex and pattern matching, which means uh, some dynamic data that you might be able to get through that request, so like a, an API token. Um, you can match that using a wildcard rather than having to match exactly. Um, it's got human readable output. Uh, so the JSON files that are recorded, you can read those yourselves. It just says the host name, uh, the URL, and everything about the, uh, the request and the response. There's no manual contract definition and uh, no manual test data definition either. So you just rely on the real API to generate your test data for you, uh, which is super convenient and it means you can write really quick, simple tests. So that's my talk, I hope it didn't go too over. Um, so you can get me on GitHub or Twitter at Recall06, or if you wanna see what my company's doing, go to ADP UK on Twitter, thanks. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Um, we're gonna do sort of questions as a mingle at the end, so we're gonna whip through the other lightning talks and then allow you to talk with any of the people that have done these talks, sort of finishing off the pizza and having another drink and things like that. We figured that was the best way to go. So, sorry. Down arrow. So, um, hello everybody. My name's Sarah Gowan and I'm a lead test engineer at the Hydrographic Office. And today, I'm going to introduce you to the wonders of Cypress. So, Cypress is an automated testing tool that you can use to ensure that your UI is behaving as it should do. That's quite a general overview of what it is that it does. It's got quite a lot of phenomenal features that I cannot go into in five minutes. But what I can do is show you one relatively simple uh, UI test. So, here's our application that we're going to be testing. Um, it's very simple. It's a to-dos list. You can add 
a to-do item, you can cross it off, you can remove it. And we are going to write a Cypress test to ensure that when we add a thing, it goes to the bottom of the list. So, here is our Cypress test. What this is going to do, it's going to add three items. Um, this is written in JavaScript, and that's because it runs inside the browser. Uh, there is actually a before test step that says cy.visit um, wherever the URL is. And one of the key things that we've got here is the cy.get. And inside there is your selector for whichever element it is on your screen that you want. So we're getting our new to-do box, typing an item, an enter, and then the second one, the third one. Then we're going to get them all and just store it under an alias of to-dos so we don't have to keep going to the whole selector every time. Check that we've got a thing that says there's three items left and that the first one is item one, second one's item two, and the third one's item three. So this is, by UI testing standards, pretty easy to read. You'll also notice that compared to some other um, UI automation frameworks out there like Selenium, we don't have a single weight in this code. And that is because behind the scenes, uh, Cypress is being incredibly clever and doing all of the weighting for us. Um, one of the big benefits of running inside the browser instead of outside of the browser like you would with Selenium is that you get a lot more knowledge on what's occurring at any time. So we're going to run the test, and this is what the Cypress test runner looks like. Um, it's quite clean, it's quite simple to see, and here we've got every step that we've made. This is what the screen looks like at the end of the test. So one of the other things that makes Cypress particularly nice is that this isn't just a console log of what we did. This is our time travel machine. We can click on any part of our test run and it will take us back to exactly what the um, system looked like at the time. This isn't a screenshot, this is a full DOM. We can interrogate this. Um, we can see what happened before we did the action and we can see what happened after we did the action. And just to prove this is the full DOM that's being interrogated. This is what the actual um, site looks like under the hood. So some of the capabilities of Cypress. We've got cross-browser compatibility. This is a very new feature. They released it um, mid-February. So it now supports Edge, it supports Google Chrome and Firefox. Um, the documentation is unbelievably amazing. So the documentation that you read tells you everything you could possibly know about any command and how to do anything. But there's also um, different GitHub repositories. It's got a lot of different example code. Um, viewport manipulation. So you'll notice here, this is just an iframe that's been embedded. And you can choose what size that is. If you want that to be the size of uh, a mobile device, there's actually a couple of uh, preset things that you could set it to if you want it to be an S, the size of an S10 or anything like that. Um, so the automatic weights, the full DOM, or time travel machine. Uh, network traffic control. So you can actually stub out your server and completely control uh, what happens when. So if you want to use this purely as a UI testing tool, which is what it was designed for, um, then you can do that. Consistent results. So UI automation is known for being flaky, to put it politely. Um, with Cypress, you're not going to see that so much. And that's it's big in quite a short amount of time. This thing was only in beta a few years ago. And then there's a lot of different plugins available. So if you want to cucumber with this, you can cucumber with it. If you want to have some accessibility uh, tools plugged in, you can do that too. 
hordes of different feathers available, and there's many more coming all the time. So, yes, Flight Cruise is amazing, but there are still some limitations. And these are some of the things that will never change. So, it only supports JavaScript, um, by extension, TypeScript, and anything that you write in that you can then get to compile down to JavaScript, it will support, but because it is running inside the browser, um, you do have some limitations there. You also can't browse to different domains in a single test. So this can present some challenges if you've got, say, third-party authentication. There are workarounds for some of the more common scenarios. And then you can't deal with multi-tabbing. But then again, you've got to ask yourself, why do you need to deal with multi-tabbing? Um, if you've got an element on your page that you're expecting to open in a new tab, can't you just check that it's an A and it's got a target of blank? That'll do the job just as well. Oh, questions are for later. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. And doubly thank you for not making me fiddle around with laptops as well. So amazing. Um, Bonnie, cool. So um, what I'd like to say just for a couple of seconds is we are just trying out lightning talks. So if you've got any ideas about what might be good in this spot, do, do hang around, have a chat afterwards. And you know, this isn't fixed. We can change things. <laughs> oh, over to Bonnie. Down arrow. Okay. Um, I'm Bonnie. I work at Microsoft's office as a test engineer. Um, about six months ago, I was on my scooter, because I'm differently able, so I use a scooter in town. Went to Holland and Barrett. Couldn't even get in the front door, because they don't cater for scooters. It wasn't accessible. And then we had a cross-government uh, meeting of testers, and I got fired up by this guy from Land Registry about web accessibility. I thought I could sit with Pickett um, and Pickett, Holland, and Barrett for weeks, and people would just ignore me. But here, I can make a difference. So. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> um, everybody wins. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Everybody wins with web accessibility. It's the degree to which a project, um, device, service, or environment is available to as many people as possible. Not just non-sighted people, but people who have carpal tunnel syndrome, people who have trouble with... Um, vision, uh, macular degeneration, so that's what this is. Um, next slide. Okay, so this is for CAG. The government put this together as legislation for government websites, and this is what we're supposed to be doing with our websites. They have to be perceivable. They have to be operable, understandable, and robust. Okay, so what does that mean? You can see the definition there. To me, it looks like a thing through a jargonator. So it's not that easy to interpret what that means. So next slide. In English, we know there's a thing. We can interact with the thing. We understand the thing, and the thing works on lots of different kit. So that's what accessibility is all about. Next slide. There are a lot of automated tools that you can put. Uh, there are plugins for Chrome, Axe, and Wave. Axe by um, Deep Two, I think, um, makes Axe.core, which you can plug into your pipeline so that you will run the tests automatically for things like contrast and um, labels. And it'll, it'll look to see if it's accessible. About 40% of the tests, or 40% of the errors will be found by these. So, next slide. So you need to have manual testing as well. And 
that's what I do, and I love to do it. And my team loves it, I'm sure, when they hand me a product and I look at it and I'm like, that's not accessible. <laughs> because the contrast is wrong on that button. I can't tab through this page and, and in a reasonable order. So yeah, I, it's always, oh, it's the accessibility girl. Quick, let's run away. <laughs> but anyway, so we have to use a combination of automation and manual testing to ensure compliance. CAG is the government thing, but we also, for commercial sites, need to be compliant with the Equalities Act of 2010. So, and it basically says the same thing as with CAG. So, next slide. So, that's me. Quick, easy, and it's all about making things accessible for people who are differently abled. Wow, great talks. Um, let's move this slide on. So, um, yeah, next event, Wednesday the 13th of May, 7 p.m. I think, I'm looking at Sharon here. I think that's a big thank you. And maybe a big round of applause for everyone that's turned up. Um, you've all made it amazing. You're what makes this. Thank you. That's the end of our program. Um, if you want to have a chat with any of the Lightning Talk speakers, they're sat around here. Um, do help yourself to the rest of the pizza. Buy another drink from the front. Um, and yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm looking at the digital taunting guys at the back there. <laughs> he said buy more drinks. Did you hear that? Um, I want to say a big thanks to them as well. Um, it's, it's been a real pleasure working with them. We hope that continues. Thank you very much. Thank you.